my 32 year old daughter would like you to know that when she was eight years old and she went to summer camp and felt terribly homesick um the counselor would sing your song uh you were meant for me every night to to relax her and to help her go to sleep so she's very grateful for that <laughs> that's a very sweet <laughs> and um and recently i listened to your song no more tears and um about homelessness and it's just piercingly beautiful it just it really is heartbreakingly beautiful that's so thank, thank you, you. I'd like to begin with the interview with, not with your story, which I want to go back to, but with something that you learned, and you learned so much, and you think so much in your book. But towards the end of the book, you, you have this long poem of yours, The Infinite Ache. At the end of it, uh, you say, for you're pregnant with yourself. Can you just speak those lines? Do you remember those lines to speak then to our audience? Uh, I don't recall those lines. I can look really quick to see if I can find them in my... Uh... Well, I have them here, if you like. Oh, good. Yeah, what are they? <laughs> For your yourself, a new you, and it has its own gestation period because you cannot force nature, only nurture it. So, can you just talk about that? Because it's all about... Everybody's listening here is want to get born as their true selves. And that's what you're addressing in those lines. Um, yeah, I wish I could remember the entire poem. Um, something, you know, I moved out when I was 15 and I was really struck with this idea of nature versus nurture. And if I received poor nurture, would I ever get to know my nature? Or was I already programmed? Was it over, so to speak? Which is a really depressing thought to think when you're 15. I knew that as much as I had a genetic inheritance, I also had an emotional inheritance, this emotional language that had been passed on generationally. And we had a bunny named Caramel when I was young, and it was raised with chickens. No, Caramel played with the chickens. It did. Yeah. And it thought it was a chicken. And it would peck at food and it would waddle. Yeah. And it would actually lay on the nests for the hens. And it would hatch the eggs for the hens. Yeah. And it was very cute until I moved out when I was 15 and realized, what if I'm a bunny that was raised by chickens? And what if I never get to know my real bunny nature? Hmm. And it was terrifying. And... I wanted to see if there was a way to get to know my authentic self beneath the programming that I had received, the neural programming. You know, those words weren't around then, neural programming and those things, but the idea of nature versus nurture was, and it, through just curiosity and introspection and writing, it led me on this journey. And I had a lot of death in my life, not, I didn't die. But a lot of letting go, a lot of emotional death, a lot of trauma. And I came to find a still point in, it's hard to put words to, I came to find a still point in death, a way to relax and dilate and open and how it connects you to life in a new and profound way. And the blessing of it, of blessing, it's funny, it makes me tear up right now, the blessing of a good death, of letting go, of trusting death, of trusting nature, of trusting that process, of allowing that grief and that wave and that darkness and the comfort in it, oddly. I, I was able to find a real comfort there instead of resisting it. And then... I'm very visual, and so I would begin to see this sort of glimmering on a horizon in this really dark space, and I was struck with the idea that, you know, death and life hold hands, and you can't have one without the other, and so just as I'm dying, you know, as I was, I was writing this poem, and that book was after a divorce, 
there was also a part of me being born. And so you have one foot in each world. And so there would be days I would just tend to my death. And then there would be days I would get very curious about what my next life was and realizing that the quality of my death dictated the quality of my next life, emotionally, of course. It's, it's, interesting, you um, say, it's interesting you should say that because I'm just writing a new book and I actually ended up using, having just discovered your book, but I right away I grabbed a passage from it, which I'll quote to you later that I'm going to cite in my own book. But in writing this book, I talked to a woman who was diagnosed with terminal uterine cancer. She was told she had a few months to live. That was over 20 years ago. And she actually began to write a book about dying well. But turns out she didn't die. And what she found out was that in order to live well, you have to know, no, in order to die well, you have to know how to live well. So the two are completely holding hands, just as you say. And in, and in finding out how to die well, her uterine cancer spontaneously went away. It's, you know, there's, I don't mean to drive the conversation. I'll let you ask another question, but yeah, it brings up so many, um, so many, so many things. <laughs> Please, I'm, 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 I, just, I want to hear your thoughts. Um, so when I, I did pretty good when I was 15, I moved out and was paying rent. I started having panic attacks when I was 16. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know what, there was no word for them that I knew of at that time. Uh, they continued. I began to kind of find these ways again through kind of introspection of getting myself out of them and then even realizing I could ask myself questions, which was this an amazing process. And then I ended up in San Diego and wouldn't have sex with a boss and started living in my car and my car got stolen and I was homeless and my panic attacks turned into agoraphobia and shoplifting. I was shoplifting a lot. Beginning with carrots. Beginning with carrots. I was very interested in the toll that the stress was having on my body. I was beginning to have kidney infections and chronic bladder infections and I wanted to understand food as medicine. And again, those words weren't around then. It was so hard. I know it's hard for people to imagine now, but like the late eighties and early nineties, there was not the internet and, and, and finding out things was very difficult. Yeah. Um, and so I was trying to understand which vitamins and minerals helped, you know, mucosal linings and inflammation and those types of things. And so I was very into healthy eating. So while I was homeless, I was shoplifting organic food because if you're going to steal something, you might as well make it healthy. <laughs> um, For the bladder, you need the cranberries. Uh, not just, you know, like marshmallow root and things that help, you know, build after so many infections, the bladder lining gets rough um, yeah. and no longer smooth. And so finding things that help build mm. mucosal linings, not just dealing with the pH balance, which is sort of, you know, what cranberry juice is doing. But anyway, um, I was stealing a dress one day and I looked at myself in the mirror and realized my big goal at 15 moving out of not wanting to be a statistic. I was a statistic. I didn't, I didn't beat the odds, so to speak. And I remembered this quote that not all, let's see, happiness doesn't depend on who you are, or what you have. It depends on what you think. Mm. And so I decided to see if I could turn my life around one thought at a time, but I had so much chronic anxiety. I couldn't perceive my thoughts in real time because I was just disassociating all the time. And so I had this little hack of, I decided that your thoughts are cooled down and slowed down into action and your hands have to actuate thought. So maybe I could see what I was thinking by studying what my hands did all day. And so I started taking notes for two weeks. I just wrote everything down that my hands did. I had no idea what I was looking for. It was just the only thing I could think of to do. And at the end of two weeks, I looked back at what I wrote and there were, you know, some takeaways. I quit believing in myself and some things like that. But the much more interesting thing was, was that my panic attacks had gone away and I hadn't noticed that my mm. panic attacks had gone away till I sat down and I was, it was a, a massive side effect that I wasn't expecting of this little two week study of watching my hands. And what I had stumbled onto was presence. Yeah. Um, again, I don't think I remember hearing that word at the, at the time, but what I had stumbled onto was that my worry was a thief and it was causing me to project a past experience onto a future that hadn't happened. 
And it was kind of like, if I wanted to keep my house safe, it was like leaving my house to go look for burglars. <laughs> when I had to stay in my house to keep myself safe, I had to be in the actual moment. And that moment was the only chance I had of actually keeping myself safe and advocating for myself. And that discovery was very exciting to me. And so I began taking more and more notes and studying more and more just within myself. And one of the things I noticed is that there were only two basic, basic states of being I had. And that was it. There was two basic states and it was dilated or contracted. Mm -hmm. And then I realized every single thought, feeling, or action led to one of those two states. And so I began to keep track in my notebook. I had a section for dilated and a section for contracted. And then like, I had three subsections. Of by dilated, do you mean expanded, expansion? Yeah, expansion. Expansion or contraction. Yeah. yeah. Um, I use dilated just because I think of, yeah, uh, birthing and breathing. and But yeah, all the same thing. Um, and so I had thinking, feeling, and doing. And so for a month, I just wrote down every time I was able to notice in my body when I felt relaxed, open, dilated, expanded, I would write down immediately, what was I just thinking, feeling, or doing? And then every time I felt tight, contracted, body posture turned inward, I would write down what was I thinking, feeling, or doing? And I noticed a real pattern. And that was my internal dialogue. And that was my, it was a, a, a cheat sheet, I guess. It was a way of coming to know myself better and well, I'll let me interrupt for a moment. When I read your biography, which is really a luminous piece of writing, um, I just love the sheer language of it, you know. Um, it was almost like I was watching a double consciousness that was that inner self that from a very young age and you seemed to be quite aware of what was going on and even seemed to be aware that you are not what you were acting out and you were writing all that stuff down so there was that awareness that seemed to somehow either possessed you or you possessed it from a very early age on and at the same time there was this person who was confused and dissociated and 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 traumatized and gets into all kinds of trouble that they unwittingly generate for themselves and the book is almost like the two eventually coming together so that the awareness and the consciousness becomes dominant becomes the one in charge is that an act is, but it, but it's unusual to see that presence and that awareness arise at such an early age can you does that am i describing something that you're recognizing in yourself because i'd love to have your comments on that because most people don't seem to be that self-aware as you seem to have been. And you used to write it down. It's almost like you had a double life. The life that you lived and the life that you wrote to yourself privately. No, it's a... Yes, that it does feel that way. It did feel that way. Um, when I was young, it made me feel pretty crazy. I sort of had existential crises, however you say that word, when I was young. I remember sitting in church and my older brother was eight, I was five and he was in a play and it was all eight-year-olds. And to, to denote which eight-year-old was a boss, they wore a tie. And to denote which eight-year-old was a farmer, they wore overalls and to denote which eight-year-old was a mom, they wore a little house dress and the babies would wear diapers and things. But they're all the same age. And for some reason it really, really, freaked me out. Um, I remember looking down the pew at my parents and realizing everybody was just acting and we're all the same. And it, it sent me into a real fit. I had a real, I guess you might even say a depression. I don't know if that's possible to have at that age, but I remember feeling like I popped out of life. I popped out of reality and I didn't know how to connect again for quite a while. I remember a very, um, I don't know if you would say disassociative, but watching soccer games and being part of life later, later in the day, later in the week, and not knowing how to tie into how, what was real, nothing felt real. And that type of thing would happen to me from time to time, which was difficult. Um, you know, when my 
it served me in a lot of ways. You know, I was observant. And so when I was bar singing at eight, I saw that people were in pain. And I saw that people didn't know what to do with pain. And I could tell it was pain. And they were drinking or raging or engaging in sex or whatever it was. And nobody outran it. And I what? knew that I was in pain because what? my parents say There's again. Wait, there's a wonderful phrase in your book about you can't outrun, outrun pain. You yeah. Pain. And we all try to, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, it was such a gift that I that I saw that that moment and realized I was in pain and my data just began being abusive and I tried I made myself a promise to never drink or do drugs and I made myself a promise to try and deal with it as it came. And if I didn't know what to do with it, I would put a pin in it. And writing helped. Writing put me in a state that just took the edge off the pain enough that it was tolerable. And then this fascinating thing happened is when I wrote, I, uh, I realized I observed things that I didn't realize I had observed. Right. Or I would understand or have an insight to my dad maybe or something that I didn't realize before that moment. And so I really turned to writing as my medicator, if you will. And later, when I was about 14 and 15 and had read uh, Descartes, uh, I think, therefore, I am. And then again, pop forward to when I was 18, starting to kind of have these deeper experiences of trying to understand who I was beneath this programming. I realized, you know, it isn't that I think, therefore, I am. It's I perceive what I think, therefore, I am. Right. I'm actually the observer. I'm not my thoughts. There's, there's a gap between the observer, what I'm observing, and my action. And so the bigger I could make that gap, yeah. when I could create a big pause, a big space between me observing and then cultivate observing better and better and building a bigger, stronger muscle for observing more consciously, more presently, more frequently, and then putting a pause before I created action, that was... The image I had was a cocoon. Imagine a cocoon, like a chrysalis. And inside, I saw all these swirling colors. And outside is this sort of gray, papery, chrysalis cocoon. I had begun to believe that I was the, the chrysalis, the outside, the wrapping. Yeah. And that wrapping is actually all of the ways I was taught to behave. It was personality forming in front of us while we grow all around us, while we're growing, while we're having misunderstandings about our childhood, while we're developing responses to core wounds and core misunderstandings, our personality begins to form, our opinions about life and our world and ourselves begins to form, but it isn't real necessarily. It's just a lot of assumptions that I made when I didn't know much better. Yeah. And yeah. actions, you know, that build neural pathways and build life and build actions. And so being able to be the observer, I was able to associate that I'm the colors inside. And that's where I'm able to look at nurture versus nurture and go, I can re-nurture myself. Mm -hmm. I, because as long as I start to learn how to act in accordance to the colors, my authenticity, as you would say, too, then if I can have an experience of that, I had to create situations for me to have an experience of it and then if i could form that into thoughts feelings and actions my life would begin to be my own and not just a pre-programmed neural reaction but a formed response and that's how i began to really change the trajectory of my life 